Well, welcome and thank you to our attendees and panelists for joining us for today's briefing. My name is Erica Hanacek. I'm the Government Affairs Director over at the FACT Coalition. FACT stands for Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency. And we're a nonpartisan alliance, more than 100 state, national and international organizations working toward a fair tax system and combating the harmful impacts of corrupt financial practices. We're proud to co-host today's event with Oxfam America, a member of our coalition. So just to flag for folks that this is the first of a two-part briefing series we'll be hosting this October on tax issues. You're invited back on October 21st at 11 a.m. the same time to discuss additional policies to counter multinational tax avoidance and encourage further job creation here in the United States. Details to follow shortly. Before we get started, I'd like to note a few housekeeping items about the webinar. First, this webinar is being recorded. We'll plan to post this webinar online on our website after the event. Second, we welcome your questions and engage feedback with our panelists. For the best sound quality and to ensure we can field as many questions as possible, we'll be focusing on written questions on today's panel, which will all be muted right now. Um, but for those attending online, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature on, Zoom, on the Zoom window to send questions and comments. Um, please remember to address your question to a specific panelist and please be advised that your questions will be visible to other Zoom attendees. Now, to today's event. We're here to discuss the increasing demand for transparency measures that would impair, empower the various constituencies represented on today's panel, investors, financial analysts, small business owners, and labor unions, as well as other stakeholders to have access to the tax and financial information they say is necessary to promote a functioning economy. It's no secret that multinational corporations in the United States and elsewhere have long used tax loopholes to shift profits offshore and avoid paying taxes that they would otherwise be required to pay. Analysis by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy reveals that 91 profitable Fortune 500 companies paid no federal income taxes in the United States in 2018, while another 56 such companies paid between 0 and 5%. Multinational tax avoidance has major implications for governance, sustainability, and national security. Domestically, the US government loses hundreds of billions of dollars in tax revenues from multinational tax avoidance. Likewise, recent changes to the tax code have incentivized companies to move real assets and jobs offshore for tax purposes, the national security implications of which we've seen with supply chain considerations during COVID-19. Likewise, in the developing world, Multinational tax avoidance drains resources out of the country, making it harder for government officials, businesses, and civil society to grow a sustainable economy and respond to national crises like COVID-19. As our panelists will elaborate, transparency around multinational tax planning can provide material benefits for important sectors of the US economy. At the same time, public disclosure will give policymakers, academics, and the public a better understanding of how tax policies can impact different communities. We are a global movement toward greater transparency. In 2013, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development convened its members to develop a framework against multinational profit shifting. This framework now requires large corporations to report key financial information to tax authorities in the United States and more than 135 countries. A 2018 survey by Deloitte showed that 80% of corporations expect that country by country reporting will be adopted in the next few years. And major corporations like Vodafone, Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton to varying degrees already voluntary dis voluntarily disclose this information. Most recently, in December of 2019, the Global Reporting Initiative finalized the first global standard around public disclosure of taxes with input from major corporations, investment firms, accounting firms, academia, and civil society. The standard goes into effect later this year. While the GRI standard is voluntary, 75% of the world's biggest companies that report their sustainability results already follow this metric and 62 countries have standards that reflect or require use of GRI. In fact, after the GRI standard was announced in December of 2019, Royal Dutch Shell became the latest company to voluntarily disclose its OECD report publicly, prompting the Wall Street Journal to call it the beginning of the end of tax secrecy. And there are good signs of more to come. The Financial Accounting Sta uh, Standards Board, FASB, has announced that it will include further disaggregation as part of its generally accepted accounting principles after the FASB chairman announced at a board meeting in February of this year that he now also supports jurisdiction by jurisdiction tax disclosures. In Europe, the European Parliament has already passed public country by country reporting twice by overwhelming margins. The change in the public position of Austria, the EU Council now has the votes to enact, uh, enact this change as soon as Germany brings the measure up for a vote. And there are certain legislative developments in the US Congress that will be the subject of our conversation today. 
the Disclosure of Tax Havens and Offshoring Act. Companions bill, companion bills led in each chamber, respectively, by Senator Van Hollen of Maryland and Representative Cindy Axney of Iowa, would require large publicly traded corporations to disclose key financial information, profits, revenues, taxes, assets, and the number of employees to the SEC on a country by country basis. This information is uh, already information that these companies are collecting uh, and re reporting privately to tax authorities. Uh, for those following at home, uh, those bills numbers also are S1609 and HR5933. It's clear that public country by country reporting is an inevitability over the next few years. So without further ado, uh, it's time to hear from our experts. I'd like to offer a big thanks and warm welcome to our panel. To start, let me invite Mr. Rob Wilson to kick off the remarks. Uh, Rob is a research analyst at MFS Investment Management. And Rob, please remember to unmute yourself before uh, presenting. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Erica. So to give everyone just a little bit of background here, MFS is an active investment manager with about $500 billion in equity and fixed income assets uh, that we manage on behalf of both individuals and uh, institutional investors uh, globally. We have clients in, in over 35 countries. Uh, as, as an active manager, we seek thoughtful, accurate, and consistent disclosures on any topic that we view as financially material for the companies that we own. And I think we can all agree that um, taxes are certainly uh, financially material, uh, ranging anywhere from, you know, 5 to 10 percent on the low end up to 20 percent or more of uh, pre-tax earnings for uh, companies globally. Uh, currently, the, the financial reporting requirements regarding corporate taxes provide really little, uh, if any, usable information for investors, which impacts our ability to properly evaluate the companies that we own on behalf of our clients. So for example, uh, as we were evaluating the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ahead of its implementation, our investment team really was not able to, to properly and fully evaluate either the risks um, or the opportunities uh, that were likely to impact the companies that we owned at that time, aside from some of the very um, kind of generic uh, opportunities that uh, might result from a, a lower headline rate. Um, interestingly, uh, there were a number of companies that specifically started to forecast several hundred basis point increases in their tax rates uh, after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was put in place. Uh, and these increases were due to um, provisions like the beat and the guilty provisions uh, of the law. You know, of course, those are really just the, the beginning. Uh, there are other potential changes that are still uh, forthcoming from from the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, law, such as changes in interest deductibility, uh, that's going to have a, a really meaningful impact on, on certain companies. And we simply uh, don't have the information that we need to be able to evaluate this risk. Uh, in addition, uh, we believe that a company's approach to managing its tax bill uh, also provides some interesting signals regarding the risk tolerance of the management team and, and the board of the companies that we own. And, and these signals are really sort of just as important to us in assessing business quality uh, and governance of the companies we own uh, as, as it is for us to really understand the earning side of potential uh, tax uh, changes. Finally, uh, as we reflect on the increasing deficits and, and debts resulting uh, from COVID-19 related issues, there is certainly, we believe, a, a, an increasing potential uh, that the U.S. and other governments are, are going to need to uh, find ways to bring their budgets back into alignment. Um, and in many cases, uh, we believe that is likely to uh, result in changes to the corporate tax system. And so as a result of all of these facts, we really strongly believe that country by country reporting uh, is what we need to better understand the earnings risks uh, related to companies that we own, uh, and frankly, the corporate governance uh, as well, and the quality of the companies that we own on behalf of, again, our, our very large base of individual and institutional clients worldwide. So uh, that's all I had, Eric. I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. Next, we'll hear remarks from Mr. David Gonzalez. David is Vice President and Senior Accounting Analyst at Moody's. Thank you, Erica. Hi, my name is David Gonzalez. Um, I'm an accounting specialist for Moody's, which basically means that I incorporate accounting and financial reporting issues 
into our analytical process, into our credit ratings for our analysts. Um, one of the big things that I do cover is income taxes. And when I talk about income taxes, I think the best way to talk about it is how we would look at it from a credit rating perspective. And income taxes, like most things um, on the financial statements, have to do with sustainability and the risk of that sustainability. So if we're looking at income taxes, we like to understand where the income taxes will be in the future and whether there are any risks to the rate that is being paid or worse, if there are any surprises out in the future. And given the current structure of our financial disclosure, we basically have little to no financial statement information in order to make these assessments. We have to talk to the companies privately and use non-public information to understand what their tax structure is. And the reason that we have to do this is because there is no disaggregation of overseas income tax information. And if you think about this, I think Rob talked about how this is a material. I think everybody agrees on that and what we're looking at and why this is important. And at some point I start thinking, I don't know, I, I run around in my head that this is crazy that I have to justify why I would use a material financial statement line item that is inherently risky and is subject to fluctuation and why I have a foreign source of this where there's this essential black box that I cannot perform any analysis on when there are taxes and when there are earnings overseas. I cannot perform any analysis on it because every jurisdiction has their own tax rules and I don't know where the companies I'm looking at are stationed or where their revenue is being sourced at. So if, for instance, there is a tax law change in Ireland and I have two companies in Ireland, one has 50 stores in Ireland and one has the rights to a license that they've parked in Ireland, I won't be able to tell what the difference is between these two companies from their disclosures because from their tax disclosures, unless they have a specific issue related to that jurisdiction, I don't even know if they're in that country or in that jurisdiction. So it's really hard to assess the sustainability of a rate when you don't even know the underlying information about it and the disaggregation of this. And so when we look to what we want, and we've been talking about this for a very long time now, that this sort of black box, in order to project a black box, you need to rely almost entirely on the company. And unlike other financial statement line items, the companies give us projections, but we're allowed to challenge them. We're allowed to create our own conclusions. But for income taxes, because of this black box of foreign earnings, we are entirely dependent on companies and issuers to give us the information of where their tax rate is going overseas, because we don't have any tools to question or to use our own analysis to create where they're gonna be. Or, and, and the, the worst thing is about, we can't, create even a risk level for these companies overseas because we don't know what jurisdictions they're in, how aggressive their tax strategies are, whether their low tax rate is a temporary thing, a permanent thing, whether this is something that will be sustainable or it's just part of the nature of their business. And so as we go in and assessing a tax purpose, tax planning, we are at the mercy of the company, whereas every other material financial statement line item I have my own opinions on where they're going. I can disaggregate, I can remove one-time items, items I think are non-core to operations, but I have no ability to do this with taxes, especially overseas taxes. I mean, there's a lot of problems with income tax disclosure overall, but the foreign black box and to be here with, um, you know, you'll hear thoughtful analysis on this on a social and financial side, it, it, it just, I don't know, it starts to become tiring to say, this is important material financial information and I want more of it. Um, and to keep having to justify why and what I would do with it. But I wanted to just try and create a picture that overall from a tax perspective, we're not looking to project their taxes out to the dollar and what jurisdiction they're gonna be in the future. What we're looking to do as users of financial statements with most line items of financial statements is use those financial statements as a window into the company to be able to ask thoughtful questions about where the company is going and whether it is sustainable at the current level it is or if, if its projected earnings are sustainable as well. And with income taxes, when you have a disaggregation between your local country, your home jurisdiction, and then a black box of foreign, 
it is just not possible to do this. And, it, and it's, it's, a, it's extremely uncomfortable to rely on companies to provide you projections that you cannot challenge, you cannot analyze, and you cannot prove otherwise with what they tell you is going and how risky they're telling you or they are being. And from an analyst perspective, we like to, to monitor that line between risk of tax avoidance and tax minimization. And companies are often talking about how they are just minimizing their taxes there. Well, I always just say, if we have this disaggregated information, all of these innocent companies that are just minimizing their tax taxable liability overseas, we would have the information to be able to prove that and to be able to show that in their financial statements. But right now, we can't distinguish between a company that is has an effective minimization tra um, strategy overseas and companies that are walking that line of tax avoidance overseas. They all look the same. They all have this black box of a rate differential that we don't get any further information from. And so from both sides, from you know providing valuable company information, they should be incentivized to clear up this, this distinguishing you know, factor. And here we are, and we're four years after the last time I evaluated tax reform, and I still do not have any more tools to understand how any future tax changes, especially around guilty and beat, where we only get minimal disclosure that a company is exposed to it or has some sort of expense to it, but we don't know the underlying reason why, and that doesn't allow us to ask any further questions to show why that exposure will be there, whether it'll be there in five years, and if they change these rates, how these companies will be impacted. And that's basically all I have to say about the issue, but I do really appreciate people listening, and I do appreciate these people on the panelists because we, we need to keep talking about this and keep saying it, and it's moving towards it, and hopefully one day we will get this, you know, what I think of as a very minimal request to understand what we consider to be a highly risky, volatile, material financial statement line. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate your points there. Uh, next, we're gonna to turn to Ms. Awesta Sarkash uh, from the Small Business Perspective. Uh, Awesta is the Government Affairs Manager for Small Business Majority. Thanks, Awesta. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks to SAC for putting this on. Um, uh, again, my name is Awesta Sarkash. Um, I'm the Government Affairs Manager at Small Business Majority. Um, you know, we're a national nonprofit that empowers America's diverse entrepreneurs to build an inclusive economy. We engage our network of more than 70,000 small businesses and about um, 1,000 business and community organizations to promote and advocate for public policy solutions that deliver resources to entrepreneurs that promote equitable um, small business growth. Obviously, um, it's been incredibly uh, hectic and unprecedented time for small businesses, especially for women and minority-owned businesses as well. Um, so the legislation that we're discussing today serves to address a key risk that governments and small businesses alike face, right? So, you know, multinational corporate tax avoidance. The um, aggressive tax planning strategies employed by multinational corporations forcibly shift the burden to other taxpayers. And that's especially true for small business owners like our members who are unable to take advantage of um, some accounting gimmicky, you know, avoidance to avoid taxes. Um, so by putting the thumb on the scales in favor of big businesses, the current US tax code sort of undermines small businesses and their ability to compete. You know, they're already operating on an unlevel playing field um, and uh, this only exacerbates that problem. Um, so, you know, this is even more concerning during the COVID pandemic. So, you know, for small businesses, transparency around tax planning is the first step to leveling the playing field for small businesses, again, especially for women and entrepreneurs of color. Um, so I can kind of explain how this, you know, tax avoidance by multinational corporations puts small businesses at a competitive disadvantage. The problem first sort of begins with using profit shifting to, asset, uh, to assess, um, to access tax benefits unavailable to small businesses. Um, so small businesses, you know, even those operating in multiple countries um, do not usually engage in complex profit sharing schemes. You know, a small business owner tends to be the HR person, they're obviously the finance person, there are all these sorts of things and they're really navigating this. 
as things go along. Um, they're not experts, they're not lawyers. And so um, either because, you know, and in, in not being able to engage in these complex profit shifting schemes, either because the benefit is nominal to justify the cost or because they need ready, uh, they need ready access to their capital. So access to capital being the primary concern for small business owners, um, like our members, means that they can't easily um, keep up with, keep, you know, keep their money in tax shelters um, and still avoid uh, or still afford to grow their business. Um, you know, in contrast, several multinational corporations move their profits offshore to lower their tax bill and at times, you know, justify tax refunds that let them walk away with negative effective tax rates. So there was a 2019 report by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, which found that some of the US, uh, the biggest US companies uh, have negative tax rates ranging from negative 1.2% to negative 4.6%. Um, and so this obviously affords multinational corporations this unparalleled leg up on small businesses, um, especially during a time when small businesses are, you know, falling by the wayside, um, you know, this practice is just unsustainable and really bad news for um, a diversified U.S. economy. Um, you know, the second problem is, you know, by avoiding taxes, these corporations shift that burden to small businesses. Um, you know, in the 1950s, the collection of corporate taxes accounted for about 28% of the US tax revenue, and now it's only 7%. Um, so by opting out of paying taxes, multinational corporations refuse you know, to invest in public programs for which all US benefit, uh, businesses benefit. So for instance, infrastructure projects, work, workforce development, and education. And then um, you know, we've done studies about how small businesses view multinational corporate tax avoidance, and they see it as a really serious problem. We've done two polls over the past decade, one more recently in 2000, uh, 2017, um, that found seven out of 10 small business owners felt that they are somewhat or greatly harmed when big corporations use loopholes to avoid taxes. Um, in that same poll, we found 85% of small business owners want large corporations to pay their fair share of taxes. Um, and that was actually recently con confirmed by a poll that Main Street Alliance, um, you know, our colleagues um, in a poll that was released yesterday, their polling found that 87% of small business owners see multinational profit sharing to um, avoid paying taxes. So for us, the solution is, you know, what we've been talking about here, country by country reporting, you know, as sort of the first step to understanding the multinational corporate tax avoidance. And in order to address the problem, lawmakers and the public have to be given the opportunity to understand it. So it's a really critical um, way to ensure a level playing field for small businesses, which we're going to need, we need it before, we need now, we need it for the future. Um, and small business owners, you know, support a move toward this tax transparency. In that poll that was released um, yesterday by Main Street Alliance, three and four, three out of four small business owners support um, the leg legislation like HR 5933 um, that would require corporations to publicly report key financial information like taxes, profits, revenues, assets on a country by country um, basis. And so likewise, that poll found that 60% of small business owners agree that transparency would um, you know, help level the playing field uh, again, which is incredibly critical right now, um, and that their tax information would benefit small businesses because it's difficult for small businesses to compete with the most profitable corporations, particularly when the tax code doesn't do a great job at sort of like um, it's not particularly diverse when it comes to including um, all different types of businesses. You know, we know that certain businesses operate at revenue levels that are below what the tax code, um, uh, you know, offers as an incentive to small business owners. Um, so on behalf of um, small business owners across the country, you know, we urge uh, folks on the Hill to really co-sponsor the disclosure of tax havens um, and offshoring accounts. And that's all for me. Thank you, Awesta. And um, it's good to hear about that poll from Main Street Alliance. We'll make sure our, uh, our attendees get a chance to see that and really appreciate you offering a small business perspective.
Um, without further ado, um, let me pass it on to John Keenan. Uh, John Keenan is the Corporate Governance Analyst uh, at the American Federation for State, County, and Municipal Employees, also known as APSME. John, take it away. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Erica, and, and thanks for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about why tax disclosure is important for investors. AFSME's 1.4 million members participate in public pension plans throughout the country with over trillions in assets. A concern with the tax code is that it encourages multinationals to ship their profits, investments, and jobs offshore to avoid paying taxes. As, as we've seen with COVID and the manufacturing problems for PPE to protect our frontline workers, these, these uh, avoiding taxes can have real world consequences. The ability of pension funds to generate long sustainable returns depends on a healthy economy underpinned by a fair tax system. Tax payments fund essential services. Uh, corporate and investor tax minimization threatens public revenues and the ability to fund public pensions. So corporate tax transparency comes down to the principle of what gets measured gets managed. This is why it's important for investors. Increased tax disclosures means the company's tax practices will be managed for reputational, regulatory, and financial risks. Three key reasons why tax transparency is important for investors. The amount of income tax paid is uh, material to the company's long-term sustainability. Public expo exposure of aggressive tax, tax practices can result in legal, reputational, and uh, yeah, uh, reputational and regulatory risk. And then disclosure provides assurance that these practices can withstand uh, scrutiny. So globally, there's basically convergence that investors need this information and the companies have to provide it. The UNPRI representing over hundred trillion in assets supports country by country disclosure. CFA Institute uh, highlighted the importance of tax disclosures in a letter to FASB which has an important rulemaking uh, that is pending. And as, as uh, Erica mentioned, GRI is kind of a new standard setter and it goes into effect uh, in January and companies are already adopting the standard to disclose uh, country by country reporting. So it's, it's moving that way. Basically companies recognize the writing on the wall. 80% of companies expect to, to have to report this information. So globally you have OECD and BEPS companies are already having to disclose this information to tax authorities throughout the world. Uh, then you have uh, basically, oh, and companies already have this information. So it's not like they can't disclose it. So companies have it and now global tax authorities have it. The only people who don't have this are investors and we're the ones putting our money at risk. So as these standards kind of move forward, glo uh, globally, internationally, companies are being required to do it, companies have it, why don't investors get it? So it's something that we need and it's an important issue. And um, yeah, I, I will stop there. Thanks. Great, thank you, John. Um, at this time, let me invite folks to start using the Q&A uh, segment or the chat if, if you're having trouble with the Q&A on the uh, Zoom window. Um, while you guys uh, field your questions or send your questions in, let me uh, take the moderator's prerogative and ask a couple of my own. Um, so, John, why don't I start with you? Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the existing standards for uh, for tax transparency. Um, one thing that we haven't really delved too much in is a little bit on the European perspective. I seem to recall that the European Union put in a standard after the financial crisis. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and just the experience there? So yeah, the, basically the Europeans after the financial crisis said we need country by country reporting from financial institutions. And so the banks are actually having a, to report this information. And, and what happened was that the effective tax rate for these, these firms actually went up 3%. So you actually have this already kind of taking place and you can see what happens, but um, it, it's not happening over here yet. Great, that's helpful. I, I can't even imagine trying to legislate a 3% raise in the corporate rate uh, right now. So what a great way to be able to do that through transparency and have that kind of deterrent effect there. Um, so maybe with that, we do already have one question in the Q&A. So let me, let me pitch that. Um, David, this is for you. Samantha asks, if you have to rely on supplemental information provided by the company, 
Presumably that's not audited information. Although auditors may be aware of the disclosure, they have not provided an opinion on it. How does that affect your ability to rely on that information? Yeah, I would say, I mean, when this information and when this com comes across it, it all depends on what type of information we're looking at. If we're just looking for guidance, we, we do kind of a reasonableness check and this is helping out where their tax liability is gonna be in the future. But if we have material information or something that's going to affect our current analysis, and this is something that we, I mean, I'm actually dealing with right now. We have a company that has come to us with information that is not disclosed in their financial statements about their tax liability. And um, we have to have a discussion with them. They have to make sure, they have to explain to me based on audited information why it's reasonable first. Um, so you can kind of put together some pieces there. But then if it's material and we want to incorporate it in our analysis, we need other information. And so it, it creates a whole nother process for us where typically this is contractual, we get loan documents, we get contractual information to prove their assertions. And this one in this, in this filing, they actually provided us IRS filings showing what their liability is with the IRS, what this is here, even though it's not disclosed in the financial statements and it's actually disclosed a little bit misleading because they only put the expense side, they didn't put the liability side. And we care much more about the liability side because it could be net down certain tax attributes. But we had to go and get IRS filings for them in order to incorporate it into our analysis. Um, and it, it, everything has a different level of it, but obviously this would be much better. And with this country by country stuff and the country by country information that we do get, one of the big problems we do have is this exact one, is that we don't have audited information on this. We can have um, management and have the Treasury Department provide us with information on country by country and help us understand what their tax strategy is, but we don't have that sign up on auditors because so it doesn't get included into our analysis at the level of audited information. It's more supplementary and it's able to supplement a story that automate, audited financial statements tell us, but it doesn't give us the lead story. It's just, it needs to be proved. It needs to have a lot of other work and it's weighed less because it's not audited. And so it, it's, it's just another reason we would like it into the financial statements. Thank you, David. And maybe if I could just add one thing to uh, David's response. I think it's also interesting uh, to, to note that you know, this kind of uh, discussion with companies is, is very inefficient, uh, both for a firm like Moody's, but also for a firm like MFS, where you know, we have over uh, 1,500 different companies that we own in various portfolios. And, you know, for us to try to, you know, talk with individual firms about um, taxation uh, across all of those is, is very inefficient. And that's why uh, for us, you know, improved disclosure uh, is something that would allow us to to just be uh, uh, much more efficient in in our work, which uh, of course is important to all of us and and our work life uh, balance. That's very helpful, Rob. Thank you. That's a really good idea. Um, wonderful. Uh, with that, we'll turn to the next question, Rob. This is also for you. Uh, some opponents of country by country reporting argue that it would require corporations to disclose sensitive business information. Uh, do you think that's a concern for you as an investor in these corporations? I don't really see it as a concern. I mean, if you, um, back in uh, 2013, I sort of did a deep dive into the various um, avoidance strategies that companies use. And, and there, there, there are only sort of six or seven really common strategies that companies use. I don't think there's really a lot of sort of sensitive tax strategy that isn't being employed elsewhere. And I don't think there's a lot of sensitive business information in the way that, you know, companies have kind of routed profits through individual companies. You know, from, from our standpoint, uh, you know, what we want to see is firms that are, you know, basing their financial position and, and their competitive advantages on uh, high quality products, uh, high quality services um, on, on, you know, a good quality uh, management team that you know understands how to run the business uh, throughout an economic cycle, so that we can produce you know consistent uh, or as consistent as returns as possible for uh, our our um, clients. So I I, I certainly uh, have you know heard that uh, concern raised in the past. Uh, I just 
don't think personally, and I think as an organization, we just don't believe that there's a lot there in terms of, uh, you know, it really being some kind of uh, competitive uh, problem for, for these firms. Fabulous. That's really good to understand. You know, we mentioned a little bit about um, the sensitivity of the information, and, and that doesn't seem to be quite the concern. Um, another thing that's come up in some of my conversations is, is concern whether this is burdensome for companies to collect. Um, if you know they already have access to this information, is it that burdensome? And uh, you know, just how, how does this work with the current standard? Maybe either David or Rob, if you want to speak to that. I mean, I can touch on it a little bit. Um, I know a lot of information. I mean, burdensome to collect, this is one of the frustrating things that I deal with. I mean, just generally, if we talk about, you know, income tax disclosure and any proposals that are out there, when you look at something like the FASB and you look in there, I don't know exactly what they call it, but basis for conclusions as to why something's not done, there's always the burden to collect um, this information and this is one of the things that I just I just don't truly maybe I just don't see it as they see it. But um, if you don't know how much revenue you have in each jurisdiction or how much taxes you're paying in that jurisdiction, I think you're in a lot more trouble than um, financial reporting, meeting financial reporting requirements. This is data that just needs to be organized to have a operating company. And I mean, as far as the burden goes, I mean, it, in accounting and in a financial accounting, there is the consideration of a burden on companies, but it is a cost benefit analysis. It is not just a cost analysis. And in this issue, it has largely been lost on is the benefit side and what we talk about and all of these benefits of getting disaggregated information. And I'm all for, you know, reducing burdens on companies for information that we don't generally use. But for new information that would provide value, the cost can be overridden. Even a substantial cost could be overridden. And we're just leaving an era of financial accounting where there's been two, three, four completely transitionary um, standards issued that caused companies significant financial burden. They had to implement new systems to implement leases, to do new revenue accounting, to install the insurance accounting that's coming around the corner. So it's, the pieces just don't add up. This is a transparency issue. This isn't a burden issue. This isn't a users won't understand the financial information issue. It's just about transparency and what companies want us to know versus what they can reasonably allow us to know. And I think, you know, maybe what I would just add to that response quickly is, um, so I was part of the seven member team uh, for the GRI, the, the tax task force that, that put the uh, country by country reporting standard together. And, um, you know, I, I would not tell you to go on, you know, my knowledge in this area, but what I would say is that this came up a number of times in our discussions. And um, we had two people uh, that were very well positioned to be able to address the issue. Um, so one was the uh, treasurer and, and sort of head of tax for uh, Vodafone. And the other was a partner uh, for PwC in their Netherlands office. Uh, both of them uh, very firmly believed, and the reason that we arrived at the country by country standard is because both of them believed that this would not be excessively burdensome for you know large companies, multinationals, where we need this information to be able to collect and produce this information. Again, they're doing it in Europe, um, you know, already uh, for you know in in a private way, and uh, and so this would just be kind of a, a public uh, display of that information. That's very helpful. And um, you mentioned, and I think John may mention this in his comments too, that uh, they already provide, are already providing this information. And uh, it's not even just in Europe, but you know, with the OECD, with engaging in the BEP standard, it, it really is happening almost worldwide. Um, I think it's 137 countries that are subscribing to the OECD standard. So um, if they're already collecting this information, it should be easy enough um, to, to be able to repackage that and, uh, and share it with, with the public. So that's very helpful, thank you. Uh, another question, um, I think David made mention of the FASB in, uh, in his remarks also, but uh, to follow up, we have a question that says, the FASB initially decided not to pursue country by country reporting on the ground that it could be misleading. Um, if it required a gap, uh, it would be presumed 
that the role of the auditor would be to make sure it is not misleading, as with other accounting measures. Can any of the panelists speak to the status of FASB's project, and has the new chairman made any statements about the importance of country by country disclosure? Um, offer to the panel first, and if not, I'm happy to field. I, I'd jump in real quick. Yeah, I think this shows kind of the importance of the, the comment process. Um, they put this out and said, hey, we're just going to give you a lump sum on, on foreign tax. And investors weighed in and said, no, actually, you, you're going to have to go back and do this all over again, just because we're going to get this information sooner or later, and that investors need this. And I, I think um, the, the, the process is currently on hold and kind of with, um, you know, just dealing with the pandemic that, um, that they're, they're going to look at it. And um, yeah, hopefully further consider um, give, giving more, requiring more information for investors based on the fact that it's material and that they need it. So, yeah. And I guess I'd just like to say that you know, as, as investors, myself and uh, all of my colleagues, I mean, uh, the vast majority of us, of us have CFAs, CPAs, um, you know, this shows, you know, how much of, of a, a, a nerd that I am, but I've been studying accounting since, you know, I was 16 years old. Um, so I think this idea that, you know, um, investors aren't able to kind of process and, and, you know, evaluate this information is, is misplaced. Yeah, Absolutely. and I, I would, yeah, I have, I mean, we have a, a lot of issues with the, this whole process, but I find this one to be just downright the most insulting one, um, that country by country analysis would just be too much for us to handle, or that we don't understand accrual accounting, and we wouldn't understand the difference between having a large cash payment and an expense in a certain country. Um, these, these, I mean, and then, and, and this, I, I, I would I would echo to what John said about this process and getting the investors. I mean, I, I really do think that the comment letter for the first time that I've seen when the proposal came out, it really did change something in favor of investors where they were going to go ahead without country by country and it at least paused it and caused them to reconsider. And I know Russ Golden, as you mentioned, had said on his way out that he supported it, but he's obviously not part of the, the FASB anymore. So we're waiting for new direction on where this will go. But I think that the, the comment letter process there, and incidentally, I wouldn't even be here if there weren't comment letters on that, because that's how I got connected to this whole um, movement and group was reaching out to the comment letters, because I saw a very thoughtful investor comment letter on income taxes, and I reached out to everybody attached to it. Well, I think you really underscore the importance of the comment process and how strong the demand is for this. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, when the comment process went through, I think it was 100% of investors, something like 50 investors, uh, reached out to FASB saying this was of critical importance for them, it was material for them in making capital allocation decisions um, and to figure out how um, they can mitigate their risk. So that's absolutely essential. Um, with the FASB, at least in my experience, the FASB moves at a snail pace. And so it really is important to look at other avenues um, in addition uh, to, to move this process forward, so looking through Congress, the BSEC, um, and, and beyond. And so you know, really underscoring the need for this to be a conversation that's happening um, consistently, especially over the next few months where uh, you know, the, the future of COVID funding, the future of um, what America's political future looks like, it, it's really essential to have this um, trend chart for transparency um, fulfilled and, and moved through. Um, so thank you. Would you mind, Erica, if I, I, I'm sort of interested actually, Awesta, in, in your view on, you know, when you, when you kind of think about this from a small business standpoint, you know, what exactly, you know, do you sort of mean by small business? Because I could think that, I could imagine that there are uh, a lot of even very large businesses um, based in the U.S. that, you know, are, are having to compete with uh, multinational firms that perhaps, uh, you know, have a, a lower overall tax rate and, and may, you know, have a, an unfair competitive advantage in, in that kind of circumstance. So just would be interested to know, you know, kind of, how, you know, how big of an issue this is in terms of, you um, you know, uh, even some very large businesses that might still kind of categorize themselves in that, uh, you know, smaller or, or, or regional business category? Yeah, that's a good question. I think generally speaking, we find that because small businesses don't have, um, don't always have really significant take home revenue, um, you know, they're off, often operating, as you mentioned, like really small dividends. 
uh, from the small business perspective, any time that there are tax incentives um, that actually positively impact them, that tends to have pretty exponential positive responses in their, in, in their small business. Typically, they're um, hiring their first or second employee, they're, built, they're um, contributing to their local communities, their workforce. Um, so they're already, they tend to operate often at a more disadvantaged level. Um, I mentioned this before, but the tax code tends to, you know, the tax incentives for small businesses tend to actually, um, you know, keep a, a whole chunk of small businesses out. You know, the, the sort of bracket that we see the tax incentives at tend to be over, you know, $120,000, $150,000, whereas a lot of small businesses are below $100,000. Certainly that's the case for um, some women and minority owned businesses. And so there have been measures to, you know, you obviously can't um, change the tax code based off of sex or race, but um, there have been measures to sort of focus on those businesses there because they're not even receiving any tax incentives. And so, um, you know, coupled with the fact that a lot of these multinational corporations are getting these negative tax rates, um, you know, it's not even at a point where they're on, they're competing at a disadvantaged level. They're in totally different universes. Um, and that only exacerbates um, the problem for these uh, small businesses. Now for us, we have a lot of small businesses that uh, tend to be in the, you know, the smallest of businesses, like 20 employees or less. Um, certainly we have small business owners who operate um, with, you know, 100 employees or so multiple locations or you know but that's not the core of the small businesses across this country and so i think whenever we think about how do we give small businesses um, you know to me it should be a leg up because it's like i said they're kind of operating in a totally different unfair universe um but at least on the same le level um, things like disclosure of um, taxes is, is really critical because it can help us sort of address where small businesses aren't actually getting any benefits. Um, and ultimately, what are the disparities that the small businesses are facing um, that these huge corporations that already have the resources to like retain a workforce, um, like paid leave, for instance, um, and so on and so forth, um, uh, we can sort of kind of address where we can put some um, federal dollars in order to make sure that the small businesses are actually benefiting from tax, the tax code. Great, thank you for your reply, Lesta. I think that's really helpful and it was a great question, Rob. So with that, we had promised you 45 minutes. Uh, we're a few minutes over. So um, I think with that, maybe we'll close this panel here, but the conversation's not over. Uh, we'll be following up with additional materials by email on uh, some of the items that the panelists had mentioned and the increasing trend for transparency uh, and demand for it. Um, and with additional information all, also on the disclosure of tax havens off an offshoring act. Um, and with that also, just let me uh, offer a warm thank you to my, uh, my panelists here and also to our attendees. And we invite you to join us again on October 21st, 11 a.m. for a conversation on multinational tax avoidance, um, specifically looking at closing tax loopholes and uh, reflecting on the benefits of the no tax, uh, no tax break for outsourcing act. Um, so thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.